So um, I, I took these two. These are actual clients that I had. And ironically, I had them at about the same time. So the contrast was really, the similarities and the contrast were really bold to me. And it, they made me really think it was, it was nice that they sort of happened at about the same time because it really made me think about what are the similarities, what are the differences and what am I looking at in these bodies that is making those differences in what seemed to be sort of a similar situation. So I tried to give you a, a picture of what this person, these people, these two people looked like. So if we look at case Laura, I called it because <laughs> I had just sent an email to Laura and her name was in my mind. <laughs> so this person, uh, I wrote down, she's from, she's a Asian descent. And the reason why I put that in there is because there, there are different body types. And what we find in more Asian body types is that they tend to tend towards a posterior tucked pelvis a lot of the time. And then they tend towards a little bit longer torso and shorter legs. So th that's what she looked like. Um, naturally posterior pelvis, uh, which usually leads to a little bit tighter hamstrings, a little bit of a long torso. Mm -hmm. um, and then her primary complaint was actually low back pain. And then she had some discomfort at her hips too. But low back pain was her main issue. And then hips was second to that. And then, so we'll stick with her first and then we'll talk about Jenny, Case Jenny. So when she walked into the studio, the first thing I noticed is that she has a sort of forward flexed, right, forward flexed posture and she's sort of marching. So meaning her knees are coming up a little too far in front of her. I like to call that marching gait or quad gait or something where, that, where you can imagine, right? The foot feet are coming up a little bit too much in front of her. And then... She has a lot more knee flexion and then she has a lot, little, very little hip extension. In fact, I don't think her leg passed zero degrees, right? She just sort of went underneath her and then took a step forward. So her gait was very forward of her body with very little hip extension. She had increased kyphosis in the thoracic region and sort of that forward head posture positioning. So she, when she stands still, I could see that pelvic tilt, posterior pelvic tilt, so butt tucked. And then what was interesting, she goes to lie on her back with her legs in hook lying. You guys know what the hook lying is, right? Then knees bent, feet on the table position. And while she's in that position, her head, her butt is tucked still and her head goes back and she is uncomfortable. So the kyphosis is fixed, she doesn't flatten when she goes back. So I need to put a pillow under her head to give her that comfortable positioning of her head. And then, um, she gets even more uncomfortable if I have her stretch her legs all the way out. So, but if I bend her knees, her, her, she's okay in that position with the head pillow under her head. Right. Then I flip her over to her belly. And when she goes on her belly, her bottom is a little bit up in the air and there's a space right at the front of the hip. So right in that hip crease. And if you ask her to bend her knees, her hips lower a little more to the table. So she bends her knees, her hips go down a little bit. And then you try rolling her back on her back and you have her try a bridge roll up and she can do it with her legs bent like a normal bridge roll up. But if you place her feet in the trapeze or on, in the Cadillac and stretch them out straight and ask her to do it, she can't do it anymore. So she's uncomfortable even with her legs out there and she cannot bridge, she can't find the bridge at all. Okay, so that's sort of the picture of this case Laura. So case Jenny, what's different, or she's Caucasian descent. She's much taller, like longer and a little bit differently proportioned. So longer torso, longer legs. Um, doesn't have a naturally tucked posture, has a naturally very neutral, kind of run in the mill neutral posture, was athletic as a kid and coordinated and stays pretty, seems pretty coordinated. Her primary complaint is hip pain and possible and some knee pain. And the interesting thing about her is that she had some short-term memory loss. So it was really hard to know how much pain she had after a session, how much pain she was having kind of in a day cycle. I like to find out how much pain they're having in their day, you know, from morning, noon, evening, night, just to sort of track 
what might be causing the pain. And she couldn't really report that back to me at all. Uh, and she had a helper with her, but her even her helper couldn't really um, couldn't really figure out or keep track of the um, pain or the pain cycle through the day. So I didn't ever get a full grasp on how much pain for how long at what times of day. So when she comes into the studio, she has a little bit of a shuffle to her gait, but she seems pretty well balanced. So I don't think the shuffle is because of balance. She has um, her tail slightly tucked and definitely decreased hip extension with her gait. She has some increased kyphosis, but she's looking at the ground when she walks. And so that might be causing that kyphosis. So she's kind of looking forward at her feet as she shuffles walking. She stands in a posterior pelvic tilt with her chin and her eyes down. But when she lies on her back, her head goes comfortably down to the surface. So it's just a slight chin up, but not, not like that kyphotic, unflexible posture of Laura's case. Her legs are most comfortable lying on her back with a pillow under her knees. She has discomfort in her back if her legs are all the way stretched out. And she feel, but she feels like she can't pull her knees all the way, bend her knees and bring her feet all the way into her bottom either. When she lies prone, you notice that she, her bottom is up in the air, just like in Laura's case. And there's a space at the front of the hips. But if you ask her to bend her knees, her butt lifts up more, goes away from the table rather than down into the table. So then you think, okay, then I thought, all right, let me see what happens when I bridge with her. If I try and bridge with her, she can't do it with her knees bent. If I bend her knees, put her feet on the table, she cannot lift her butt. Or even, even a low bridge is really challenging at that point. But if I take her feet and I put them in the trapeze of the Cadillac or up on a ball and stretched out, she can bridge up all of a sudden, like, like nothing. It's super easy. She can bridge up. So there we have, there we have it. It's really two different cases, two different cases that seem to present similar. So I wanted to pick your brains. I mean, I worked with them long enough and I have the picture in my head exactly. First, I thought maybe what other questions do you have? Maybe I can answer them. Maybe we can talk through the questions. Would you have about them? I guess. I would ask about their approximate age. Oh, okay. So yeah, sorry. They're both in their seventies, both about okay. the same age. Mm -hmm. And then were they couldn't do the bridges or it caused them pain? Um, where, where were they feeling? At what point did they feel the pain? Right. So um, it was, it was interesting because so with, the second case with uh, Jenny's case, right? With her knees bent, she would lay in hook line with her knees bent and her feet on the table and she couldn't bridge. She could coccyx curl a little bit, but she could not press her butt up. But as soon as I went to straight leg positioning, she was lifting her butt up. And then with uh, Laura's case, right? She had her legs and hook lines, she could bridge up. But if I straightened out her legs, she couldn't lift up. So let me put it this way. What other things, so it seems like, what does it seem like, where does it seem like the problem might be to you? Or where some of the problem, there's probably more than one problem going on here, but where, when you think about this, where do, where do you start thinking, okay, I wonder if there's a problem here. Or I wonder if there's a problem there. With well, Laura, I, oh, go ahead. No, you go. I was just thinking with Laura, it almost sounds like um, her, her posterior chain, it seems really tight. So maybe something with the rectus femoris and that whole region. If she okay. can, if she's comfortable with her knees bent, bridging, but she no, but she can bridge up. So then she, she Laura can bridge up. So Laura can bridge can up bridge. with with her knees bent. With her knees bent, but cannot with her legs straight. With her legs straight. So let's go this way. Let's take it piece by piece. First of all. If you see somebody, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be your model. Okay, there I am. So if you see somebody coming into your clinic or studio 
but a little tucked, rounded forward here. Okay, can you see? Um, so when you see this at first, and you see somebody walking in, and we said with the first case, with case Laura, that she's walking kind of like this. You've seen this, right? So no hip yeah. extension. Okay, what, if we're looking at here upward, what comes to mind? Forget the legs for a moment. What's, what's going on up, up above? Some stenosis and her body is naturally trying to compensate for it. But you threw space. me a little bit because you, you talked about the kyphosis and that she was Asian, not to, not, but, but I, then I thought, was there some osteoporosis going on as well? Yeah, but, maybe, maybe, but I think stenosis is more accurate, right? So mm -hmm. when somebody has a stenosis in their spine, they tend to want to go towards flexion. Right, and then already tucked body. So say I'm already tucked and now I want more flexion in my spine. Watch what happens. Right, my legs go, right? I lost my alignment here because I'm already tucked and now I have to keep more length. So I'm going into my quad. Mm -hmm. So now when I go to walk my waist back and now my head goes forward because I want my head in front, right? And then right. I walk and my legs go this way. Right, they come up in front and look, there's no hip extension. Yeah. Right. So yes, that would the stenosis would be a very good guess. Okay, what about Jenny? Do you think she also has stenosis or what do you think? So if she comes in, she's still posterior. She's shuffling a little and she's just looking at the ground. So this is more what she looks like. Still a little bit tucked here. But she's balanced. So she's not shuffling for balance. Um, you think she could potentially also have stenosis? Or what do you think? I think, I think she could, but I think, oh, am I on? OK. Um, really tight, tight hip flexors. So yeah. Yeah. Tight. Tight um, hip, tight hip area, I'm going to say. So, yeah. yes, tight here so we don't get extension, right? When this is right. tight in the front, it's really hard to get any sort of extension. So, and what's interesting is that if you posture yourself long enough, in our first case, right, our Laura case, if I posture myself enough here, what starts to happen over time? Shortens shortens right yeah. but if i if i'm um tight in my hip flexors and i go to walk and maybe i have a little stenosis right that's where this comes in mm -hmm. if i'm tight in the front i'm going to say front of the hips front of the hips may not be hip flexors we'll see right front of the hips i'm going to walk with a bit of a shuffle yeah and i i think the looking down or in in what i've seen is the looking down is is a little bit about fear, wanting to see what's ahead of them because if they shuffle, they might they tend to trip a little bit and then they look down and yeah, you know. Right. And the yeah. difference is, so the truth is they both actually have some stenosis. Mm -hmm. um, but I think in Laura case, the stenosis is worse. In the Jenny case, maybe not as bad, right? In the, um, so yes, I think stenosis is a good thing to think about. So anytime you see that sort of butt tucked lengthened spine posture and a little bit forward, you wanna think that. The other difference, right? We, I was mentioning in that description is that with Jenny, when I lay, brought her to lay down, she, she got stuck here, right? So she stayed kyphotic here. And I had to put a, to support her neck because her head was not going to go down right and once i did that she was comfortable in this position with jenny i could lay her down she came out of that forward head she laid flat but but she was uncomfortable here and she was uncomfortable here so uncomfortable here for anybody 
means that extension is not comfortable in the lower spine. That's what you want to keep in mind. Uncomfortable here because I and um, if I don't hold my center, my back ends up arching here, right? So I get that space and that's uncomfortable. So bringing the legs up typically gets rid of that space without me or lowers it at least so that I don't have to do the muscular work of it, right? But then with Jenny, I put her here and she's uncomfortable. But if I put a pillow under her knees at about this angle here, that's where she was happiest. Right, so not down, not bent, but here. And then the bridging, right? So hopefully you're churning in there now, the bridging, right? If I am the first case, which was Laura case, I put her here and I said, can you bridge up? And she went and she said, I can't bridge up from here. She could do, she's post here already. And she was trying to bridge up and nothing. She just couldn't do it, right? Wait, is that right? No, that's wrong. She could do it. She could lift up from here with the first case with, um, with my Laura case. She could lift up and bridge here, right? No problem. But I put Jenny here. We just said she doesn't like bending her knees. So her legs are way down here and she can't get so that she can press up. She can't find it. She can't do it. So here's where you need to start thinking about oppositional muscles. Okay, so if we start breaking this apart, what would prevent someone from being able to bridge in this position? Why would, what, what things, there's, there's, let's think about the muscles that have to fire. What muscles have to fire for me to bridge in this position? Glutes and hamstrings. Glutes and hamstrings, yeah. right? And I know, I know yeah. we like to, that's exactly right. I know we like to talk about abs, but actually the motion is coming from glutes and hamstrings, right? Yeah. Whether I'm neutral or whether I'm tucked, it's still glutes and hamstrings. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's where the power has to come from. Okay. Wh what can prevent glutes and hamstrings from firing? Uh, pain in the back, nerve damage in the back or sciatica, okay. but yeah. Okay, awesome. So nerve damage that does in the back. So that would be, you're thinking low lumbar SI mm -hmm. levels mm -hmm. are the ones that innervate the glutes and hamstrings. It's L5 S1 basically. Mm -hmm. So if there's damage at L5 S1, she's not going to get the muscle activation, but let me, let me throw in here. Her glute strength, her hamstring strength was just normal, actually. It was normal. When we tested it in more functional mm -hmm. and in other positions, she had, she had muscular strength. She had nerve information enough to get a good muscular contraction of the glute and hamstring. So that's, that's a great theory, though, especially because we know she has stenosis. So really good thinking. But in this case, it, that wasn't this, what happened. So what could be another thing that's preventing in this position from lifting up? You said she was very kyphotic and I wondered if that, mm -hmm. that lying there was just uncomfortable, but that's kind of a guess. Okay, and lifting so, up would put too much pressure. Okay, maybe, but she can't do it. It's not that she's doing it and she's hurting. She can't make it happen. She's here, right? If I took the pillow away, she's in this position, butt tucked, head up, right? And she cannot seem to get the butt up. But you said that she could do it with her legs straight. So does it have ah. something to do then with her feet and her... Mm -hmm. I'm, sorry. Kind of I keep, I keep, I'm sorry, I keep mixing them up. She can bridge up here. She can't bridge up with her legs straight. This is the, the, I keep doing that to you. I'm sorry. Okay, so here, let me put myself there so we don't get confused anymore. The first one can bridge with her legs here. Yes, that's right. Okay, she can bridge with her legs here. She cannot bridge if her legs are out. So, and the other key here is that if we go on the tummy, right? And I, when she gets here, she's like this. 
But if I ask her to bend, it actually goes down just a little bit, still up a little, but goes down a little bit. So it's not as when she goes down, it goes up. What was this? Didn't that have to do with the front, the tightness with the front of her hips? Okay. Yeah. So what is the tightness at the front of her hips? Direct. I mean, like what muscle or what, what's going on? Yes. I want to know what, I want to know what muscles are causing the tightness at the front of the hips. The rectus, perhaps the psoas. Okay. Perhaps, perhaps one or both of those. Yes. Which one of those? (laughs) <laughs> the spine. Okay, so if I give you that clue, her head doesn't go down. Now, who are you thinking? What's spine. the difference between what? Are, okay, what's a spine? You're thinking spine. Yeah. What's yeah. the difference of origin insertion with rectus and psoas? Well, rectus would be coming from your your um, your hip versus your psoas connects to your spine uh-huh. and where do they insert where do they so as to the well the psoas would be to the greater lesser but yes the lesser trochanter <laughs> trochanter lesser trochanter psoas right so where is that lesser right. trochanter we're going in from the spine, in across an internal hip. Uh huh. Lesser trochanter, great. And right. rectus is from ASIS. Where does it end? In front. Where? Here? Or here? Where'd you go? There. Hold on. I can't there. see you. Be- oh, below the knee. Below the knee. Oh, you right. Can you see me? Yeah. No, I can see below you now. The knee. I don't okay. I think below the knee right so Mm -hmm. rectus is asis Mm -hmm. below the knee so as is spine to lesser trochanter right so i go like this i roll her over she bends her knee it actually lowers a bit is it rectus or is it so as think don't say she lays on her back she's stuck like this Rectus or psoas versus rectus. Why? Um, because the knee it. is in flexion in both. Because of the knee, yeah. Good. Directions, Good. right? And the insertion okay. is below okay. the knee. So right? <laughs> is rectus, okay, okay. Is rectus on more stretch here or here? With the bent knee. Bent knee. Mm-hmm. Okay, so if she bridges and she can do it here and her spine is being pulled here. Then it's a psoas. A psoas, right? Because here, right. rectus is more on stretch. Mm. And so, she can handle this stretch. It's the psoas can, that's the issue. It's this that's the problem. Mm, so it. if I take rectus into, if I take psoas into isolation, which is this one, legs straight out, and ask her to bridge up. She can't do it anymore because she has to stretch her psoas. Mm. Her psoas doesn't stretch. Her glutes can work and fire, but if her psoas is that tight, she's not going to be able to lift her butt. Or she'll go to here and that's it. She can't get up there. She can't get up because that has to open. Right? You have to open the front of the hip. Especially if we cue a a coccyx curl up to bridge, right? Gotcha. So then let's think back now. And and then while psoas can come really only T12 to L5, right? At its or its attachment point in the spine, it's causing that posterior tilt in her case, which is emphasizing that and she's ended up in this totally front tight posture, which is what you had said you initially, and she's stuck here. She can't get out of this posture. And there, like Kim said, there is that stenosis there too. So she's ended up, I think, in her case, first with stenosis, changing her posture to avoid the pain in her back. Remember, her primary complaint was back before hip. 
right? So she changed her posture because of stenosis. And that's how she ended up in this tucked stance posture. Then she started walking this way, never extending the hips. And when she's not walking or standing without extending her hips, she's sitting without extending her hips. Mm. Those that have stenosis actually feel better sitting, right? So they're much more comfortable sitting. Um, and so they spend more time sitting. And so as is short and sitting. Rectus, not so much. Rectus still is bent, uh, is flexed. Right, so keep her in mind. Now think back to our Jenny person, our Jenny case. Right, she lays down, her head goes down. Okay, so not as, while her butt stays a bit tucked, yes, but her, um, and her chin's a little up, she's got some tightness, but age, age-related tightness. So she's not looking at the floor because she's stuck in kyphosis. She's looking at the floor for another reason, which I think Kim pinpointed as fear because she knows she's shuffling her legs. Right? But why is she shuffling her legs when she's walking? Well, let's pull it, let's pull it apart and figure it out. She is not comfortable in the position I'm in right now with her knees bent. She's only comfortable with her legs about there or elevated straight. Why? What have we done that's different here to here? Shortened the rectus. We not it's not on stretch. Not on stretch. Rectus is not on stretch. Has it affected psoas very much? Just changing the position? No. Because we're spine basically spine. the right, basically the same amount of hip flexion that's here. We've only changed the knee flexion. Right? So her hip um, didn't change as much. Her rectus femoris changed in length, mm -hmm. right? So here it's not on stretch. So here her rectus is so tight that she cannot lift up her hips here because of the amount of stretch we put on rectus. It is so tight that her glutes can't overpower it to lift up in this position. But if we take rectus off stretch and we put it on slack, she can fire because her psoas will open. Interesting. Right? But, but her rectus won't. Right. And then the, the other really big giveaway in this one is that if she lays on her tummy, right, with her hips elevated here up and bends her knee, her butt goes right up. She mm. cannot. Yeah. She cannot because now we've put rectus on stretch. That's about how much she came up. It was pretty amazingly a lot. <laughs> Interesting. Right? Hmm. So then, okay, picture that. Now, what am, what's, gonna, what's that going to do to my gait? The, the simple thing is, right, I can't extend. We know that. Mm -hmm. So what else can I not do? If my rectus is that tight. Bend the knee. Bend, yeah, bend your knee, yeah. Can't bend the knee. So how am I knee. gonna walk? I'm gonna walk without bending shuffle. my knees <laughs> or extending my hip. I'm gonna shuffle. Yeah. So she, she did also have a little bit of stenosis. Yeah, but... Um, I think, but she actually also had to uh, probably needed a, had a one hip replacement. I didn't write that in there years before, um, probably needed a second hip replacement and also had a knee issue. Like I said, it was really hard to pinpoint how painful the knee was. So we actually did send her to get an injection in the knee, sent her to the doctor. The doctor did an x-ray and gave her an injection in the knee, which did improve her symptoms somewhat, but that rectus was so tight that mm. even the injection in the knee wasn't enough like I had to put two it was too hard to stretch it got so tight so I had to do more manual work but she was this fragile little almost 80 year old and I couldn't really like I needed to get in there if I was going to open that up manually or find a way to stretch it but it was so tight that it was super hard to to stretch for her so we went to safety gate safety pain modulation and stretching what we could 
you know, for her as much as possible. But does that make sense? So it, it was, there's, they're so interesting to see side by side, right? You, they walk in the door and you look at them, they go, you, you would say right away, they have tight hip flexors. Neither one of them extending their, extending their hip, but they are very different cases. Whereas Jenny's case was primarily the stenosis that drove her problem. So the addressing had to be more core control, core strengthening, spinal lengthening. That was my focus with, Je with sorry, with Laura, the first one was that, I keep doing that, I'm sorry. <laughs> With Laura, I had to really focus on core and spinal lengthening because I was focused on the stenosis part first and the hip, we did a lot of hip stretching and hip opening because I needed to get to psoas to help open that up too. And, and so we did a lot of that work and we did gait retraining with some hip extension, but she just didn't have the hip extension to use. So we had to really work to open psoas. With the second case, which is the Jenny case, right? I had to actually work on hip opening, more rectus quad stretching. That was the focus first. Then st stability was the second focus, right? Because we, she need, would need to have stability there. She doesn't end up in lumbar extension and irritate her spine too. So, right, different focus, different muscle, rectus, psoas, right? Um, so as because of the stenosis rectus, because of the hip probably dysfunction and the, quad, I don't know how her quads got so tight for, you know, without her noticing oh, oh, probably over years of tightening. I don't know why. I don't think I've ever seen quads that tight in my life before, but I had these moments where I would have one of them and I'd have the other one the next day and I'd be like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. Look at how, how different and how similar they both are but really teasing out what was going on and why her, their gait patterns were what they were. So I could just figure that out step by step. And then I knew why they were walking the way they were walking. So just working on gait because you were trying to retrain gait because she's an older person shuffling her feet wouldn't get you anywhere because the problem wasn't balance or coordination. It was tightness. She couldn't functionally do it, right? With those cases, do you also consider or take time to open up you know the chest and then the the thoracic spine also or or do you mainly focus on the gait and what's driving that and then kind of you and then move into that later potentially yeah so uh, that's a great question yes uh yes to all of it so yes <laughs> Yes, I definitely want to address that kyphotic posture because that is driving some of it. Now, within the first case, in Laura's case, it was going to be really challenging to unwind that because with the tight, I would work on getting the tightness out of her thoracic spine as much as possible. But sometimes when you ask people to get when, when they're like this already and you ask them to start lifting here and they don't have the flexibility for it they okay. end up doing this gotcha. arching the back right. and this stays forward and they're arching back so then she's putting pressure on the area of stenosis like can right. smiling because i think you've seen those lots of times right so i haven't fixed this problem i just compressed her spine more. where yeah. more so um i usually attack the easy, right? The easy parts, which are, none of that is easy, of trying to get the psoas open, bring awareness to that. The core stability, because once I get this stable, then I can start working on extending behind it with my hip only without changing the back. And then I can work on opening this above it without changing my lower back right? so that we can get it up. So I tend towards stabilizing core, opening hips first and then working the kyphotic spine. But you know, it all melds together. If you've got 45 minutes or an hour with somebody, you can't just focus on the hip the whole time, they'll die, right? If you stay on their legs the whole time. So we do do some opening uh, little by little and to try and get it all going on uh, at the same time so that they're seeing results throughout the body, which will ultimately help. But yes, that's why I said yes to all of it. <laughs> so, gotcha. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, any other questions? Those are good questions. I, I always, this is sort of a comment, I guess. I always wondered why <clears throat> uh, some new clients, when you, I have them lay down 
they immediately, and it takes several sessions, they immediately want to straighten their legs, even though, you know, I've start, I thought I've trained them to bend their knees to put the ball in between and, you know, they immediately want to straighten their legs. And I, I, I hadn't occurred to me that it was the rectus that mm -hmm. they're either just really tight and it's not comfortable to have the knees bent. Yeah, it can really be uncomfortable for people to have the knees bent. Yeah, yeah. If, I think mm. in the ideal world, they wouldn't go all the way straight either. They'd go like this example of Keith, mm. Jenny, with a little, if you get, if you offered them a little pillow under their knees, they'd be like the happiest campers on the planet. Knees don't have to be bent. Legs don't have to be totally straight. They're probably the most comfortable there. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, um, yeah, rectus can really pull tight and it can cause dysfunction. And it's interesting because I have to say that my, when I have people with low back lumbar issues, my tendency is to want to really focus on opening hamstrings because then we open the chain for the sciatic nerve. We get some nerve gliding, open the piriformis. So that hip rotation stretch, those are the two I go for first, but I've and then later I'll add the rectus stretch, the quad rectus stretch, which is the, the simple, right? Bent knee, open hip stretch, or you can do it this way, bent knee, open hip, right? That's rectus versus psoas, right? Psoas is the straight leg version of that. That's psoas without rectus, yeah? Really, really big distinction and really important to make that distinction in stretching people because they need to get stretch rectus and so as not just um, one or the other. But I often don't go to the rectus stretch as soon as I go to the hamstring and piriformis stretch. And sometimes that's a mistake, I think. Part of me doesn't want to do it because most people do this incorrectly, right? And they end up doing this and they put the leg way up there and they arch their back, right? So they don't get, they get pain here, or discomfort, and they don't quite get what we're after in this stretch because it's that zipped up glute forward almost leaning backward with a long tail that gets this on stretch, that rectus on stretch there, right? It's not about going like this and bringing the foot up behind me. Now I have no rectus stretch happening because well, I took the psoas, I took the hip flexor out, right? I need to take the rectus all the way on stretch, which is slight extension and flexion. That gets rectus all the way on stretch. Yeah. So it's a little harder to get that right for somebody with low back pain because they end up arching their back a lot of times until they really know how to do that well. The, uh, um, so the, so I, I'm saying all that because rectus is often indicated, stretching rectus is often indicated when somebody has low back pain because just as the hamstrings attach to a, um, ischial tuberosities and down and can pull on the pelvis, rectus is attaching to ASIS right? And down. So it can pull on the pelvis as well. So that's why it's a key also. So safer ways or this, one of the safest ways is to train them to do it here on their belly, right? And then press the front of the hips. I even sometimes have them put the hand down to feel and then try and bend mm -hmm. the knee back, right? If they're really tight, they're going to do that. So you, that's why the hands there, you have them push into the hand and then have the leg come in. Yeah, and only as far as they can go without the butt flying up, right? If they can't get far at all, then you can do the strap, right? So they have the strap so they can keep the leg long and they can keep pressing down into here. That press down will keep them out of their lumbar, low lumbar. It'll keep that tail long, right? So on the belly, if you can get them there is the best way. You could even put a pillow there if you needed to they'd still get a, a pretty decent stretch if somebody was so tight they couldn't even get it flat on their belly without pinching. Yeah. Kim, you wanted to ask you. a question about a different client, right? Really quick. Um, just I noticed, uh, but yeah, um, I have this new client. She has pretty severe osteoporosis and some fractures. And I think the fractures are in the lumbar, lower lumbar. And uh I, I noticed with bridging today, um, coccyx curls are kind of okay, but as soon as I had her do a roll, try to roll up, not good at all. As soon as, um, so then I had her feet on the bar on the reformer, not good. 
So it wasn't until I had her put her feet flat on the floor, so a mat bridge basically, and and not a roll up, but a um, just a plank bridge, that yeah. it was comfortable enough for her. So it was just a comment, yeah. I guess, because of the fractures. Yeah. I mean, you know, she just said it wasn't pain, but of course she's, you know, very cautious and should be. Yeah. Yeah. And just that little bit of flexion, I guess. Um, and the angle with her foot on the bar, that didn't work either, even even no. in the plank bridge. Yeah. Yeah. The I would definitely say keep her in no movement of the spine. So everything is neutral spine and held. So no rolling, even in the cockpit curl, she'd be one of those candidates. Okay. So really just um, neutral spine, plank bridging, if she can do it. It, um, okay. there is movement in the spine, even with the plank bridging, holding neutral, because there's a little bit of extension compression work, which once the fractures are healed, which actually be probably a good thing. Cause remember, we want to encourage bone growth by compressing slightly, um, mm -hmm. but any sort of compressing bone to bone. So extension work will really help. Um, so you could try those out, but I wouldn't do any rolling of any kind, not even the safe, what we usually consider safe. Okay. So, all right. yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then what about cat, like on all fours? I had her on all fours with a, a neutral spine, just bringing the leg out and back, not picking it up, just bringing mm -hmm. her leg back. I did have her do a little cat, you know, lifting the belly up and that didn't seem to bother her. But mm -hmm. I'm trying to I, get some activity in the abdominals. Yeah, I would probably stay in neutral, cat in neutral. So belly up the spine without moving the spine for now until those fractures have a chance to heal. But okay. I would, yeah, I would avoid all flexion. And, and the and, neutral spine leg going out is a great exercise. Yeah, that's a right. stability. That's a great exercise. If you were going to pick like lifting that leg is probably better than doing a cat rounding. So lifting okay. the leg puts a little extension pressure on the spine. And that's actually the better one if we're going to put pressure on the spine. Yeah. And then, and then she can't really be in supine for very long. Mm -hmm. um, I did try wedging her a little bit of a wedge, but um, she got tired. That's all. She, it wasn't yeah. too painful, but. Yeah, you might put a towel under her lower back into that in, uh, lumbar curve, give her some support. Lumbar. Okay. Yeah, so okay. you might just fully support the spine that way so that it's neat, so it can stay neutral. Okay. So try that towel under her lower back. It might give her a little more endurance. I was concerned that she wouldn't have enough endurance for a whole hour anyway. So she, but well, she she feels like um, we've done three sessions, and she feels like she's got hope. Okay, great. So, <laughs> just, yeah, and she and great. she's already standing up straighter than she was last mm -hmm. week. Great. Oh, that's so great. Yeah. 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 Can I ask yeah. a question about a similar? Well, not a similar, um, but similar to Laura. Is it Laura or the other the other one that Jen. can't do the bent knee? Bent um, knee was Jenny, yes. Okay, so but this one is she's a younger woman, and she had had an old meniscus tear, mm -hmm. and she was saying that she was starting to feel discomfort sometimes when she was doing lunging. Would that again be something to do with the the rectus, or like when she would go into deep squats and stuff? She said it would hurt. So yeah. would that be again, like a rectus thing or your? No, that's probably, do you know which meniscus it was? It doesn't matter mm -hmm. that much, but it's probably it's the screwing of the meniscus. So with full flexion at the knees, right? We get um, a screwing type action on the meniscus. So a pressure with a tiny bit of rotation. So oh. it's probably legitimately pressure on that meniscus that was torn. Gotcha. Okay. So yeah. then you wouldn't put her in that position at all, right? You wouldn't put her as deep into a squat at all. You would avoid the pain range of that. So work okay. in the range that it's not painful and gotcha. not push into that 
Yeah, and then the other thing to watch is tracking, right? Sometimes if it's a lateral meniscus issue and the knees are too narrow, there'll be compression laterally because they get okay. a little, we get a little um, angled in, right? From yeah. the hip, the Q angle gets bigger. So there's pressure laterally. So sometimes moving the legs out or the ball in between, or even going into kind of a second position squat can gotcha. be comfortable, whereas okay. parallel or inside of parallel would not be comfortable, could not be comfortable. Depends on which meniscus it is. Yeah. Okay. okay. And then one last, if the foot falls in, the medial meniscus gets pressure. So mm. if the arch flops, I'm going to mm -hmm. go in bending. I'm going to get medial pressure. So if it's Got medial it. meniscus, watch for the arch of the foot. Make sure that's not flattening. A lot of Flat. people flatten their arches when they squat. Right? Yeah. It's a lot of work not, not to flatten those arches when you squat. Okay. Got yeah. it. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. But rectus always gets tight in people who are active. Bikers, runners, um, sitters people who sit <laughs> mm -hmm. a lot that rectus gets tight with with um so as gets tighter sitting but for hikers runners walkers uphill the rectus gets super tight it's working hard mm -hmm. so it needs to be stretched a lot yeah thank you you're very welcome